Hi, I'm Derek. I'm an alcoholic. And welcome to Presenting to Non-AA Groups, how we carry the message outside the rooms the easy way. And the easy way is, I find in most things AA, it's to do with our literature and what our literature suggests. Um, that literature contains a lot more wisdom than I contain when it comes to this particular subject, or in fact, any subject about AA. But you can see there in that uh, diagram above the title, look at all the different types of people, professional people in particular, that we have traditionally tried to connect with. And not just professional people, you can see uh, students there, for example. Uh, but we have always tried to carry our message to anyone who has contact with an alcoholic. So it really works in the simplest way. We inform all of these types of people so they inform the alcoholic who's never been to a meeting or has been to a meeting but uh, has lapsed and maybe needs to get to a meeting again. And then from there, it's up to us to carry the message and help that person or those people out. Now, in effect, that makes all of those different types of people our marketing team. And there's quite a lot of information uh, in our traditions about how that works. Of course, we remain anonymous at the level of media, for example, but a doctor or a nurse doesn't. We've had people on our board, for example, here in AA Australia who've been media trained and are quite high profile and they become um, our spruikers, if you like. And uh, it's important, therefore, that we at least tell these people what we do. And then it's up to them, of course, whether they want to carry the AA message to the alcoholics they come into contact with. That's their business. It's never our business. But the more we inform these people about what AA is, what AA isn't, um, the better for us and potentially the better for the alcoholic they come in contact with. All right. Why AA needs members to present to non-AA groups. This is Bill Wilson's perspective. Here's what he wrote. To reach more alcoholics, understanding of AA and public goodwill towards AA must go on growing everywhere. We need to be on still better terms with medicine, religion, employers, governments, courts, prisons, mental hospitals, and all enterprises in the alcoholism field. We need the increasing goodwill of editors, writers, television, and radio channels. These publicity outlets need to be opened ever wider. And that is from the 12 Concepts, page 54. Now, that's a fairly compelling and quite assertive case that Bill Wilson is making. That this is part of our responsibility as members who've kept coming back. We need to get our message out to the people who can then get our message out. So, suggested structure. So we got some motivation coming from our literature and now let's look at the suggested structure. So this is coming from a great pamphlet, uh, speaking at non-AA meetings. It's been around for a while, but this structure is as good, I think, as it ever has been. Translates to online PI opportunities and speaking opportunities as much as face-to-face. -face. Introduction. You identify, you request anonymity be respected. Giving the reasons for that. So that's where the teaching about AA starts. Potentially read the text as suggested, um, the text around anonymity. AA what AA is, the preamble, the 12 steps, the 12 traditions, meeting types, open, closed, public, and even meeting formats. That basic, let's call it demographic information and the real ground zero stuff that we have steps and traditions. I use the preamble a lot. I unpack the preamble and I'll show you later on how I do that. I find that unpacking the preamble bit by bit, concept by concept, literally opens up AA to these non-AA people. Personal recovery story comes into it, but it probably has a slightly de-escalated focus than you would have in a, a normal meeting share. We talk about our drinking patterns and experience, why you decided to seek help, what you found in AA that helped you and how you feel, and what your life is like today. And so it sounds like a share you'd have in a meeting, but it is slightly different because we are describing our alcoholism and what alcoholism is from an AA perspective to a non-alcoholic. So we're not 12 stepping these people, but we are talking about the same content, but with a different focus. Four, how we can work together, how to contact AA, what we can do, what we can't do. Um, you know, for example, we're not professional. 
in the drug and alcohol space. Why knowledge about alcoholism and AA is important. And, and look, part of that is we're not ramming this down your throat or telling people that they have to contact us or believe in us. We're giving them the opportunity, as it says in the title, public information. We're giving them information. What they do with it is up to them. The trick is that we often have to present for various specific lengths of time. So for example, when I do rotary meetings right across the world, the standard length seems to be about 15 or 20 minutes tops. So I kind of never speak about AA for longer than that. With your personal recovery story, as I've said, be careful it isn't your main focus. It's not an AA meeting, so your story serves a different purpose. I've actually rehearsed telling mine for a non-AA audience, partly because I tell it to an AA audience in an unrehearsed way so often <laughs> um, that I had to kind of teach myself how to package it up for a different audience quite arbitrarily. Some members thread their story through the other section. So in other, other words, as for example, I, I unpack the preamble, I can drip feed my personal story through each point that I make as examples, as anecdotes. And um, as with everything AA, this is a suggested structure. You can do whatever you like. AA is one huge suggestion at the end of the day, but I'm hoping that you'd at least consider being willing to look at what the collective wisdom of Alcoholics Anonymous has laid down in that pamphlet. I find it quite astoundingly effective. I've never really deviated from it. Okay, so I'm going to leave this presentation. We'll talk about arranging speaking opportunities at the end of this. So this is my example presentation, and we've offered this up around Australia and people use it in a variety of settings. I've tried to make it non-audience specific. Um, I think that this information is as useful to one audience as to any other. I don't know if our literature suggests we create completely different presentations for different professional groups, for example. Um, I think this could work as well for teachers as it does for doctors, nurses, whomever, lawyers. Okay, so I'm gonna clap my hand and we'll begin. Okay, so welcome. Uh, thank you for letting me speak. My name is Derek, I'm an alcoholic. And I'll explain what that means. Let me start with why you didn't get my surname. We have traditions in AA, the same way you would have a mission and vision statement perhaps in your organization. And as it says here, these are suggestions as to how I accord myself both within AA and beyond, like right now. So right now, I am looking at the 12th tradition, which states anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. So I could come here and I could big note how amazing it is that uh, I'm sober these days and I'm awesome and thank you AA, but really it's all about me that's actually going to lead me back to a drink because our solution is not a medical solution or a psychological solution. It's a spiritual solution. Most spiritual solutions tend to, you know, need you to be humble in order for them to be successful. So for us, um, me giving you my first name is simply a way of remaining somewhat anonymous. And therefore I can, I'm crossing my fingers, remain humble while I speak to you tonight. Because what you need to hear is what AA is through me you don't just need to hear about me. In fact, I take very little credit for my recovery and my sobriety. I owe all of my uh, sober success to Alcoholics Anonymous. In other words, I'm not here to talk about me per se. I'm here to talk about AA and how it helped me get sober. Trust me, I'm not the miracle, AA is. To that end, a few stats. Right, the fellowship began in 35 in Akron, Ohio, USA. Story goes, a guy named Bill, who had somewhat of the, a solution, was tempted by a drink, but he'd been staying sober in a somewhat spiritual way, in a way very similar to the way we stay sober today. He had the chance to drink, but in the end, he called the hospital instead. So the bar was to the left and the hospital was to the right. He chose to go to the hospital after calling him up. He found an alcoholic to speak to. He carried the AA message to that second person. The guy's name was Bob. Turned, turned out he was a doctor at the hospital <laughs> and Bob got sober. Therefore, there were two people working the same program in roughly the same way. Boom, AA was born. There are currently around 2 million AA members around the world, 180 countries, which is pretty amazing. 
A lot of them are in the States, but there are also a lot of us around those other 179 countries. There are about 18,000 members, we think, uh, in AA Australia. We don't keep accurate census records. <laughs> We're a somewhat um, under-resourced organization in terms of keeping those sorts of um, records. We're really not focused on that. We're focused on helping people get sober. Uh, there are around 1,900 meetings per week in, in Australia, which is a lot. Uh, of course, with the recent COVID uh, situation, we couldn't do face-to-face. -face. Suddenly, there were Australians going to all of the meetings around the world. And so 1,900 became a very small number. Uh, it was an interesting time for you, I'm no doubt. It was certainly for us. So we have a book called Alcoholics Anonymous. And this book is our principal text. It was published in 1939 by that first guy who could have turned left for the bar, but instead turned right to the hospital. Four years later, out comes the book. They wrote the book so that uh, if I was in, for example, Seattle, which is the other side of America where Ohio was. So we had, you know, in 39, when this book came out, there was a little small bunch of alcoholics in Ohio, another small bunch in New York, total about a hundred members, right? All getting sober the same way. And that way they wrote down in the book, tried to keep it really accurate. The book's purpose is to basically record how these first 100 people got sober. But what if I live in Seattle? What if I live in London? What if I live in Canada? What if I live in Australia? How do I get sober? I read the book. This book contains lots of great information. And I will point out, this book was written as much for you to read as a non-alcoholic as it was for me to read as an alcoholic. And it says this about alcoholism. If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic. This sentence, when I read it for the first time, finally convinced me of what my problem was and why I needed to keep coming back to AA. I identified with it. Now, you may not. You may actually be the opposite of this as an alcohol consumer. I wish all of the world that is the case for you, that you can quit entirely whenever you wish to <laughs> and um, you don't need to quit at all. Um, <laughs> and so that's the point. I found I couldn't quit entirely. I, I, the last 18 months of my drinking, I, I was swearing off on a daily basis. I've got to stop drinking. This is the worst situation to be in. I know alcohol is my problem. I'm never going to drink again. 12 hours later, drinking again. I could not quit entirely, despite passionately wanting to. Then there's the fact that once I start drinking, I have little or no control over the amount I take in. All right. And we call this an allergy to alcohol. It's why you'll hear a lot in AA. It's a disease. Many people around the world call alcoholism a disease. And it's because it presents as an out of control desire to drink as much as possible. You know, and that was me. As soon as I had a drink, the idea of swearing off just completely disappeared and was replaced by now I must drink and drink and drink. It never felt like a choice to. Certainly not the amount I consumed. So there you are. There's what I identified with, and I think what most, if not all people who keep coming back to AA identify with, this very simple definition. And that's the way, as I say, it was for me. So for me, it was really the last three or four years in my drinking where I finally lost control. And look, with some of us, it seems to happen from the very first drink. They start drinking at 12 or 13 and the gloves are always off. You're always drinking into blackout. Um, losing all control. For me, it was a progressive thing. I started drinking at 22. And uh, I don't know whether that was a part of it. I'm not a medical professional. I have no idea. So I cannot really self-diagnose. What I can do is read our literature, listen to other members share and identify. Well, that's, that sounds like me too. And that's why I go to meetings, by the way. For me, as I say, it was just the last part of my drinking history. I drank for 25 years, had some control in my 20s, less control in my 30s, and I was pretty much out of control in my 40s. And it was a strange thing that I've already talked about. The idea that I desperately wanted to stop. I was drinking my way into more problems, and I was drinking away from the life that I actually wanted to live. Glass by glass, bottle by bottle, day by day. And... I desperately wanted that old life back. I wanted to live within my morals. I wanted to live within my values and make, make, make good decisions, values-based decisions. 
But I found more and more the alcohol was taking that away and I was making dumb choices. The thing that got me into AA as much as anything else was this. I was living with someone for, at that stage, about 28 years. And she saw me and lived with me for five whole years before I took that first drink. We got together 17, 18. She said to me at the end of my drinking, you, um, she, so she knew the sober me. She had a, nearly half a decade of knowing the, 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 the sober me before I took that first drink. Then she certainly knew the drinker she was living with for the next 25 years. Or so. She said to me, you are making worse decisions at 47 than you were at 19. And she had me. I was sitting there in the palm of her hand. It, it threw me. And worst thing that could possibly happen, she said it to me while I was sober. <laughs> and therefore, I had the opportunity to either think about it or drink over it. For whatever reason, I chose to think about it. Kept drinking for a while, but that thought, that comment never, never ever left. So I went to my first meeting. And what did I find? What is AA? Here's our preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution doesn't wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. This is our preamble. It's been around for decades. And it unpacks not how we get sober. It unpacks our fellowship, our organisation, and what its focus is. And I want to just unpack points bit by bit. And I look, I can almost guarantee you if you stick with me for the next five minutes, you'll know everything you need to know about AA, um, what it is and what it isn't, or at least enough to walk away with something that you can cogitate on down the track. We are a fellowship of men and women. In other words, we are not professionals in alcoholism. We're just a bunch of drunks trying to get sober. There is no common factor in terms of what makes a human being an alcoholic. We come from all different places, all different races, all different head spaces. Um, it doesn't seem to favor men and women. I mean, the guys who originally got sober were all guys, men, but women came into the fellowship pretty soon and now it's a 50 50 thing or thereabouts. But we are not professionals. You ask me about how alcohol even affects my brain once it's in my bloodstream, I cannot tell you. Have no interest in knowing. I just know I needed to stop drinking and I helped. Um, look, we share our, their experience, strength and hope with each other. What does that mean? That means we meet a lot. We share our experience. In other words, what happened to us, why we came to AA. But what we learned here is our strength, our recovery, the program that we find in AA is our strength and our hope with each other. I have hope now, right? When I came into the rooms nine years ago, no hope. So it's really important we meet and we share, we meet and we share and we keep ourselves sober. Newcomers come in, we help them um, discover the solution that's on often here. And if they want it, we help them keep coming back. So whether we've been around a while or just a day, we meet a lot and we share a lot. We solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. We stay sober, one, by doing the steps. And let me be clear, the only solution that's suggested for alcoholism in AA is abstinence through those 12 steps and B, helping others do them too. So if I'm now sober, if I've done the steps and I'm not drinking, well, then I'm going to keep that by passing it on. In other words, I would be drunk now if I didn't help other members not be drunk now, if that makes any sense. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Okay, alcohol, there's no juice or fees and that kind of thing. Alcoholism is described in our literature, it is defined. So that sentence I read out earlier is a description. It doesn't feel like a medical diagnosis, right? Only I can call myself an alcoholic. And as long as I have a desire to stop, AA is a pretty cool place to be. And I will not get kicked out for any reason. I don't care who someone is, if they're an alcoholic and they want to get sober, they get to stay. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. 
we're self-supporting. We're not allied with any outside organisations, denominations, politics. You know, we don't have any you know, opinion about how other people get sober, all right? And uh, that's all about why, for example, I can't accept a gift tonight. You could try to give me one. I'm not going to accept it because I'm not here for that. We self-support and we've been, been unallied with anyone or anything since 1935. We actually approached the richest man in the world around 37, very early on, Rockefeller, his name was, John D. Rockefeller. And we said, we hear that you're philanthropic and give to check. Could you give us a whole bunch of cash? You know, and he was the person that said, no way. I could. I'm giving money to other charities, but I'm not going to give it to you because you guys are special. You're actually drunks helping drunks. You don't need cash. You need purity. Purity of thought and purity of approach. I'm not going to pollute you with my money. You don't need money. You just need each other. I'm going to keep you on point and undistracted by not giving you money. <laughs> and we had to learn that from a billionaire. Um, but he, he had a point and that point became our point And we live that point to this day. We don't engage in any controversy. All right. We don't support anyone. You will never see our logo supporting a political party or a, a rehab or a, or a detox center. We don't say we're the only way to get sober. We're one way that's worked for us. That's it. You know, and we really keep, as I say, our message pure. It works for us if we basically don't work for anyone else. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. My disease is lifelong, as must be my recovery. I have to give it away. In other words, my message that I've learned. Someone gave that to me. 12 steps work for me. I have a higher power. It's a spiritual program. Part of that is helping other people get spiritual too. And hopefully we all remain sober together. That's the only reason AA exists. We do that via these 12 steps. Now, I'm not going to take you through these 12 steps, but you can probably glance over them and see why. Well, you can probably tell me why I freaked out a bit at my first meeting. I saw there's a big word there. It's used a few times. It starts with a capital G. <laughs> I was like, okay, I thought I had a drinking problem and you're telling me I have a lack of God problem? Hmm, that's interesting. And look, it is a spiritual program. It is what it is. And we like to show people who aren't alcoholics this program too. And I'll just point out a few things. That inventory, step four, we write down every resentment and fear that we have. And we look at it and we use a very safe, structured process to end up looking at only our part in hanging on to that fear or that resentment, what we did. And we take accountability for that and we let the rest go. It's a miraculous process, but from the outside looking in, it's like you wrote down every resentment you've got and you made it go away. Well, sometimes it comes back, but we're trying to make it go away. Why? Because resentments turn into drinks pretty quickly, you know? <laughs> and, um, all I can say, look at nine, by the way, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, the people we've harmed, if you look at step eight. I have, I've literally sat down with everyone I've harmed and I've said, I express regret for that. I'm an alcoholic. I'm now doing step nine. I made a list of everyone I've harmed. You're on that list. And they usually go, yeah, yeah, yeah I should be on that list. And yes, you are on that list. I want to express regret. I've sat down. I've faced those people, the people I've done over, treated poorly, and I've made amends. And I can walk around free as a result. Some of those people still aren't speaking to me. Some invite me out for dinner sometimes and this sort of thing. No control over what happens, but we have to do this stuff. And when we do, it's incredible. It's a great life. Okay. How do you contact AA if you wish to? Some of you might walk into an alcoholic one day, an alcoholic situation. You may remember that I've spoken to you and you may want to suggest AA. That's not my business. I'm not here to sell you AA. I'm here to basically tell you what we do and what we don't do. We have a website, super easy to remember, aa.org.au. We have a helpline, 1300, and then six twos in a row. A, A, A. This website provides anyone who's keen with the information that they require to elect to go to a meeting or not, elect to call or not. But 
you could all pick up your phone right now and be talking to a member of AA in less than 10 seconds. Depends how long it takes them to, to pick up, which is a pretty incredible thing. And sometimes 10 seconds, 15 seconds is all an alcoholic has. What do we suggest you can do for someone who may have a drinking problem? We're not telling you to do anything. What are we suggesting? Just start a conversation. This all comes from our book, the book I talked to you about earlier, suggestions, what people can do. Have a chat. Avoid judgment or telling them what to do. It doesn't work. Um, doesn't work well for me if you tell me what to do sober, <laughs> let alone when I'm drinking. Um, the, the next thing is to suggest a great way to learn about alcoholism is just by attending a meeting. We never say, do the 12 steps, get a sponsor. We suggest, hey, listen, if you wish, why not get to an AA meeting and just check it out? See if it's for you. You can even take them to a meeting as long as it's an open one. Most of our meetings are open. Uh, a, a few are closed. Only members can go. Uh, and there are a variety of meeting formats. I always suggest try and find one with the word beginners in the title. We have beginners meetings. That's for newcomers. We have book readings. We have meetings that focus on an individual step or even a tradition every, every meeting. And so it goes. Show them the AA website, meetings list, and uh, are you an alcoholic quiz? They're really good to do. Um, that quiz is on the website. I answered nearly every question yes, and it utterly convinced me I needed to keep coming back. And on that note, um, I'm ready to answer any question you may have. That's, I think, around 20 minutes. You may do it differently than me, and that is fine. Um, I thought I'd just end by general tips about arranging speaking opportunities. Rotary groups, great to get your apprenticeship done with Rotary. Uh, individual chapter via their website. They have, like most Rotary meeting groups, individual groups have a website um, and there's a contact. Schools and police, it's good to drop in, shake a few hands. Okay, face-to-face -face stuff. Works really well. GPs, drop in, talk to the practice manager. Give them maybe call first and um, see if you can't. I'm, a, I'm still due to speak to all the GPs in a particular clinic where I live in Castlemaine. And uh, it's been on the cards for a while. COVID's really stuffed that up. But um, the practice manager was my, my way in. She's very supportive. I went there and I spoke to her one-on-one, -on -one, left some literature for about half an hour. And um, she was very open to it. I stuck to the script, by the way. Um, when I had a chat to her. Start with the local council website for a contact person for all of your local health medical community groups. Very handy. Unis and TAFE, look, it's harder to get to these people. Um, they're often in classes, but relevant departments often have a contact person. Look, some uh, like medical type uh, professions have a peak body organisation of some kind, and uh, it's good to sometimes contact people within those you know, unions, for example, this sort of thing. Uh, look, there are many more tips for organising to speak in that pamphlet. It's a one-stop shop. Look, I think in terms of getting going with presenting with AA groups, it's great to talk to people who've done it before. In fact, it's great to go out with an experienced speaker who does it. That's the way I've always done it when I've been a speaker picker. Uh, it's good to create a database of, of AA friends, previous speaking engagements. Look, anyone who can help you grow your confidence, but also your skills at representing AA out there in the wide, big world. And, and in general, if you're an unconfident speaker, I suggest you don't use speaking for AA as a way of confronting your fear around presenting. I think it's much more important to actually... Um, Look, seek some guidance and coaching and feedback, as I say here. Sort of like try and find a, a humble, selfless reason to go out there. And if you are an unconfident speaker, then you probably need to prepare more thoroughly before you go out to make sure you aren't just doing it for you. Um, it's interesting. Here, in terms of arranging um, present, presentations, one of the reasons why we don't often do it is because we think someone more important or senior than us in AA should do it. And of course, we are the important senior people in AA. Your group can move mountains while the board and the general service office are often moving paper. 
Um, <laughs> so um, we sit at the top. It's a completely upside down structure. And, um, you know, for example, my old home group, Sobriety in the City, has decided to coordinate speakers for Rotary presentations. And that was right across Melbourne. We, one position at one group was organising lots of presenters to go out to speak to Rotary groups. It worked really, really well. So if you're in one of those larger groups, you're looking for more service positions, boom, that's a fantastic one. I now live out of Melbourne. I'm sure that position is now probably not operating and someone could be doing it. Could be your group. Groups can sometimes move PI mountains if they wish to. As I say, sometimes the other parts of the structure are moving paper. All right. So there you have it. I hope that you find the, the information in this presentation worthwhile. I enjoyed letting you in on what I've learned so far in my um, sober journey when it comes to presenting to non-AA groups. And please feel free to contact me uh, at any time if you have more questions. Cheers.